sir. Good to see all of you here today. I really am impressed. Uh, I figured y'all be out partying somewhere. Y'all just waiting on the preacher to hud, right? That's what I think. If you would uh, look at your bulletins, there are several things going on in and around the church. I just want you to be aware of those. Again, uh, we vacation Bible school is getting here faster and faster, so if you are willing to and you feel like God is leading you to, uh, uh, sign up on that. We'll find you a place to serve. I promise you we can figure out a place that we can put you. I have shamed the church for the last two weeks about our mission hall on this side over here. Uh, some of you have missed some of that, so I just figured I'd do it again this morning. Uh, the church cannot move forward without the people of the church doing something. It's not always up to the pastor. It's not always up to the to those who are uh, paid staff. Uh, it's all of us working together. Uh, and we need you to get out here and look at these uh, lists out here and find a place that you can plug in and uh, put your name on that. It doesn't mean you have to be in charge. It just means that you're available and you're willing to work. Uh, so uh, we need you to do that uh, if you will. Other than that, uh, I don't have any other announcements other than the ones that are in your book to make sure that you look at that. Uh, this morning, it is Memorial Day. Um, uh, we do want to honor those who have fallen. Uh, we, we also want to honor those who have, have, uh, the families of those who have fallen. So if you are a family member uh, uh, has fallen uh, or have someone who has fallen, I'm going to ask if you would stand at this time. Uh, I'm going to ask also if your father or, or anyone in your family, if they were in the uh, in any of the uh, fire departments or in the uh, police departments, if you would stand. I'll take a look around. They gave a family member uh, that served us and gives me the right to do what I do today. Uh, we want to thank you as a church. Thank you very much. special guest this morning. Um, my mother and my sister are here today. Uh, my mother's where I get it from. <laughs> so you can ask her anything and I promise you if it comes in here, it comes out here. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but I am excited about having them. They came up yesterday and they're, they're going to stay with us again tonight and uh, leave some time tomorrow. If you get a chance, come by and say hey and uh, love on them. Buddy. Thank <laughs> you. 
us this morning. We're glad to see everyone here. Uh, I am glad to be back. I feel like I've been gone for a month. So, uh, but going back to that video, it's a lot of men and women who give their life for our freedom. And one of those freedoms is that we can be here today to worship our Lord and Savior, which also paid the ultimate price. So join us this morning as we worship. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. To the mighty hand and outstretched arm.
Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of the Savior. The Baby. 
you have your Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I would say I try to be on my best behavior this morning, but it's probably not going to happen. John chapter 6, and we'll begin in the 15th verse. John chapter 6, beginning in the 15th verse. If you would, stand out of reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible word. Verse 15 says, Perce Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus 
withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the Sea of Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come, and the sea became rough because of a strong storm, or a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four hours or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I... Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the time of worship that we've had. Father, I ask now, as you already have, take over this service. Father, take over our hearts, take over our minds, take over anything that may distract us from your word this morning. Father, I bind Satan from this place. I ask your presence to abound. Father, as I do each and every week, Father, I ask that you remove me from this pulpit. Father, that your word will be spoken. Father, that I'll just become a mouthpiece for your words. Father, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we read John chapter 6, and as we look at John chapter 6, it doesn't sound a whole lot like Matthew or Mark, does it? Uh, about Peter wanting to walk on the water with, with Jesus, by him wanting to go out there. But you have to remember, and we have to keep remember, reminding ourselves, in John, this is not about other people. This is about Christ. And this is about the person of Christ and who he is. John's writing is revealing who Christ is. And so John doesn't put a whole lot of stuff in those few verses like Matthew and Mark do. Uh, they don't put the time of day. He doesn't do a lot of those kinds of things. But, but the other Gospels do. So we have to make sure that we understand that, that John doesn't leave anything out. He's just pointing to Christ. Uh, the other people look through their eyes just like we do. Just like I've told you many times, as, as we go out into this world, there may be some people that I may reach that you won't. But yet there will be some that you will reach that I won't. By life experiences, by how we look at things, by how things go on in our life, we, we look at those things. And people can be reached through our lives and through our testimonies that way. Matthew and Mark looked at it a different way. They held it in a different way. They were more detailed than John because John was more worried about who we thought Jesus was. So we need to hold that in mind as we look through these short verses that, that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Christ that they're looking for. Jesus is the Christ that we're looking for. Our world today is looking to fill a hole that only Christ can fill. We're, we're, we're filling it with drugs. We're filling it with uh, all kinds of different things. We're filling it with people. And yet Jesus is the only one that can fill that hole. He is the only one that can fill that void in our life. He is the only one who can calm our storms in this life. Jesus. Whether you like it or not, whether you think you can fill it or not, Jesus is the only one that can fill that hole. So we need to make sure that we understand that he is God, that he is Savior, and that he is Lord. And that's what John is trying to tell us. That we need no other than, than Jesus himself to make it through this life. To make it through what's going on in our life. Now, if you remember back in, in, in chapter 5, verse 46, uh, he said, For you have believed Moses... You have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So there's a comparison here with Jesus and Moses. There's a comparison in John chapter 6. Because why? Because the people of uh, Jerusalem, the Jews, those they, Moses was their hero. Rightfully so. Moses is the one who came into Egypt and, and, and liberated them from Egypt, brought them out of Egypt. He's the one that got them across the Red Sea, got them through the wilderness over into the Promised Land. So he was their hero. He was the one who saved them from ultimate death of that time. The Old Testament uh, is the New Testament revealed. 
We need to make sure that we understand that as we go through the New Testament, it reveals the Old Testament. It reveals to us what the Old Testament meant about things, and this is where we are. Is that as they were looking at Moses, there's their hero. Here comes Jesus, the ultimate Savior, the Messiah. What, 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 did, what did Moses say in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 5, 15? It says, the Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet, or the prophet. That's a capital P. That means he will rise up the Messiah. That he's coming. So Moses wrote about the Messiah. He wrote about the one who was coming, who would be greater than him. He says, the prophet like me from your midst, from your brother, him, with a capital H, Jesus, you shall hear. He is the Savior. He is the one who is greater than me. He is the one you need to listen to. He is the one who will come after me who is greater than me, what Moses was saying. Even though I have been commissioned by God to bring you out of Egypt, he is the one who will save your life. He will be the one who would give you life. If you look, there are four things in chapter 6, and end of uh, chapter 5 and, 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 and through chapter 6 that look like Moses. Jesus was leading a crowd. The feeding of the 5,000, there was a crowd following Jesus. Was there a crowd following Moses? Why was they following Moses? Because he was doing signs. As we look, it, it, Jesus was doing signs. At the end of that, Moses went up on the mountain to receive a word from God. Uh, at the end of these scriptures, or at the end of the, the feeding of 5,000, what did Jesus do? He, he hid himself so that he could go up on the mountain so he could rest, pray, and visit with God. You see the similarities that John's wanting the people of Israel to see. You see what he's wanting them to understand is that their hero has been overcome by a Savior. The last thing... It was Passover. What was Passover? Passover is when you put the blood of a lamb over the doorpost and so that the firstborn would not die, so that they would have life. Well, it was the time of Passover when all this was going on. And Jesus is the ultimate lamb. He is the ultimate sacrifice for us all. He is the one who can plug into that hole that we're looking for. It says in verse 16, it says, When it was evening, his disciples went down to the sea and got in a boat and started across the Sea of Capernaum. Now, this sea is like 16 miles long and about four and a half miles wide. And where they were going, they were going up the edge of it, which was about four and a half miles. Now, they didn't have a Johnson 25 or 50. They rode. That's what they were doing. Or by sail is how they would get there. It's how they would do it. But you notice it says it was evening. In other words, it was late in the afternoon when they decided to go. Now in Matthew and Mark, it says that Jesus put them in the boat and sent them across. John doesn't tell us that. We just know that they went and got in a boat that evening. We know that Jesus is not with them. We notice that he is not in the boat with them. It says, it was now dark, which is about the fourth watch, about 3 a.m., anywhere from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So in the evening, afternoon, they got in a boat. They began to row four miles. At 3 a.m., they had not made it yet. Have y'all ever been in a place where y'all just think, y'all? well, I, I know there's two that thought they wasn't going to make it yesterday. Especially Mama. She kept wondering when they was going to get here. Uh, it ain't that far, is it? Have you ever wondered, you know, it's like, man, I just, I'm just never going to get through with this. Maybe you got something going on in your life today, and maybe you're thinking, man, I'm never going to get through with this. I keep fighting against this wind. I keep fighting against this problem. I keep fighting, and it seems like it's just getting darker and darker. It seems like it's getting longer and longer. God, where are you? I can't fight much longer. God, I'm rowing as hard as I can. I'm pushing as hard as I can, Father. I'm doing all I can do. Where are you? It's become dark. I can't see anything. They didn't have flashlights and headlights and cue beams 
back then either. They were rowing in the darkness and using the stars and different things to guide them where they were going. They were rowing and they were rowing. And it said the sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. Not only was it dark, not only was, well, have they been rowing for a long time, now here comes a storm. God, I can't take much more. You know, you said you would help me through this. You said you would walk with me. You said that you would carry me through this trouble. We got in a boat late in the afternoon. Now it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and now, God, it's storming out here. Where are you? You ever felt that way? I look around this building, and I know you felt that way. I felt that way. The storm is raging. Now, you have to understand that this, this, this lake is in a, in a funnel. So at any time the wind starts blowing, it can get bad just like that. I can remember my dad. We used to live close to a reservoir. And I can remember my dad. He'll walk outside. And he'd look up in the trees. And the valise was just doing like this. He said, there ain't no need in going. Because it'd be white capping on the reservoir. But it's like in a bowl. And when that wind comes over that hill, it can stir the waters. And it can make it dangerous. Even fishermen of that day knew how quick that it could get bad. These men were men who were fishermen, men who knew what it was like, knew how bad it could be, yet they went anyway. They went into the storm that had been created, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, man, that's a long time to be rowing, isn't it? In the dark, from evening to three o'clock in the morning. It seems like all hope was lost. We ain't never going to get there. How many of you got youngins going, are we there yet? <clears throat> I've heard that before. How much longer? I want to say to a young lady that's probably going, and maybe hopefully she'll watch, but that's about as far as Walmart to back. That's how we used to measure things around home. Well, how far is it? Well, about as far as Walmart and back. They were only going four miles. You would think they could have got there by now. You're talking about the disciples. There's several men rowing in a boat. But a storm came up on them. And it got harder. You see, storms going to come. And they're going to blow. Even if you're in a storm already. Even if you don't know the outcome, even if you don't know what's happening, even if you don't have a clue, the storm may get harder. It may get worse before morning comes. You see, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. They saw Jesus at a distance in this storm, and Jesus is walking the waves. He is walking on the water. What is their reaction? They were frightened. I believe it is either Mark or Matthew says, here comes a ghost. There's a ghost coming. They were frightened about Christ. They were frightened about him coming on the waters, and yet they had just saw him. Feed 5,000 men and women and children of about 15,000 with five loaves and two fish. And yet Jesus is walking on the water and they didn't have faith. In the midst of their storm, they were more worried about the storm than they were about the Savior walking on the water. So many times we get distracted by the things around us. We get distracted about the storms around us. And we become frightened to let God have it. Well, I, I can't let you have it, God, because I have to control it. I got to have my hand on it. We become frightened to give God everything. We become frightened to let him have our life and have our problems and have our storms. Well, I just don't know that you can handle it, God. 
Yet we read time and time again, he is the God of all God. He is the king of all kings. He produces miracles, and he gives us life through the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet we cannot trust him. Why? Beats me. I do it too. He says, have faith. They were frightened because they saw the Lord coming across the water. They were frightened because they didn't understand. They were frightened in the midst of their storm. They were more worried about themselves than following God. How many of us are more worried about ourselves than following God? Now I'm fixing to be ugly. I know that's a shock. I am so happy to see every one of you here today. So happy. And please don't take anything away from this other than I am so happy that you're here. But this church house should be full. Memorial Day is not about beer and boats, unlike some other people think. You see, Sunday's for the Lord. And we should be about his business on Sunday. Now, I'm all about having a good time. You see sitting up on the hill a camper that my wife and I have. We're going to go camping at some point. I got a boat out there, too, and I'm going to go fishing at some point. But that does not negate the fact that I've got to be about God's business. And that's where we should be. You see, we're more worried about ourselves than we are the call of Christ on our life. You see, those guys in that boat, that storm was raging. Things were going on. Things were happening. They didn't know what to do. And yet, the one who was walking across the waters was the one who could calm their storm, the one who could give them life. And they were too frightened to give it to them because they were more worried about themselves than the Savior walking across the water. How many churches, how many people, how many Christians are that way today? The reason our churches are not full is because we put Christ on a back burner. We put him on a shelf. And we only want to call him out when the storm comes. And yet, when the storm does come, we don't trust him to take care of the storm. How many times have I told you, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter what this world can do to you. It doesn't matter what kind of cancer you may or may not have. It doesn't matter if you die, because you will only die physically. You'll never die spiritually. Not ever. So what can Satan do to me? Absolutely nothing. He can just make it better for me. Paul said, you know, to die is what? To gain. I'll be walking the streets of gold. I'll be shouting with the rest of the bunch up there. I told you I was going to the other side, right? Where they smile and sing and raise their hands and clap and have a good time. I ain't going to be on that Baptist hall where everybody's lips is pooched out and the arms is crossed. Y'all, we should have a good time in the Lord's house. We should have a good time in the Lord. We should want to come to God's house because it's a good day and because of what he's done for us. And we need to quit looking at the storm and start looking at the Savior. But they were frightened. Can I tell you, this morning Jesus is calling out, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what's happening in your life, but, I love that word but in the Bible. God changes everything with one word and it's called but. But. He said to them, it is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus said, it's me, boys. It's me. It's the one who can save you. He's, it's the one who can save you from your mess. It's the one who can calm your storms. It's the one who can give you life. Don't be afraid because I hold your life in the palm of my hand. Don't be afraid. I got this. I got this. 
It says, and, then, and they were glad to take him in the boat. When they realized who he was, when they realized what he could do, they realized that the Lord Jesus Christ had come near, had come to calm their storm. They were happy that he was there. And it says in the next verse, or in the next part of that verse, and immediately. It didn't take a while. He didn't say, hang on, boys, let me pull the boat along. He didn't say, hang on, let me step on the water. He didn't say, hello, let me, let me speak to this water. It says immediately. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, when you ask him to be your Savior, immediately you are saved. And there is absolutely nothing that this world nor Satan can do about it. That's why he gets so mad. That's why he messes with us so much. Is because he can't do nothing about it. And if he can render us ineffective, then he's done his job. That's the reason our churches aren't full, is because we've been rendered ineffective. Why? Because we're more worried about ourselves than we are about the body of Christ and the work of Christ. Immediately, he can change your life. Immediately, he can calm your storm. Immediately, he can take you from death to life. Because of who he is. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is not Moses. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's who he is. Not only... Can Jesus calm the storms of our heart immediately where they have no effect on us? He places us on stable land. He places us, and the boat was at the land in which they were going. On Christ, the solid rock. He places us on stable land. You see, even though the storms of life may come, even though things may come, Jesus can calm them immediately if we'll just put our faith and trust in him. You see, when those guys, when Jesus got into the boat with them, it says that the wind stopped and everything calmed. But I would almost bet that when he stepped in the boat, they quit worrying about the storm. They focused on Jesus. You got a storm going on in your life? Focus on Jesus. It doesn't matter what else is going on. It doesn't matter what's happening outside. It doesn't matter if the winds are high, the waves are high. It doesn't matter. Because Jesus is on board. Because Jesus has got this. He's telling us to trust. If you look back in Matthew, it says that Peter says, Lord, I want to come to you. I want to come to you. And the Lord said, come on. Come on. And he gets out of the boat and he goes to him and he begins to look around at the waves. He begins to look at his problems. He begins to look at the cancer. He begins to look at the lack of a job. He begins to look at, at, at family issues. He begins to look at financial issues. You just put your problem in there. That's each wave that comes at you. We begin to look at that and we forget who Jesus is. We forget he is the one who calms our storm. Right in the midst of it. He's the one who reaches out his hand. And pulls us back, back up out of the water. He's the one who gives us life in the midst of storms. Do you trust him today? Do you trust him enough? To say God I'm going to give it all to you give you whatever problem I got or whatever problem I don't have it's all yours I will guarantee you when you do that immediately your life will change do you know him today let's pray Father God I thank you for this day Father I thank you for your word your, you, Father I thank you for your love your grace and your mercy Father, that I thank you that as I'm in my storm of life, Father, I've always got an anchor. An anchor that holds. An anchor that calms my storms and places me on stable land. 
Father, you don't ask me to wait. You ask me to focus on you. And Father, you give us immediate peace. You give us immediate comfort. And you give us immediate life. Father, I pray for those who are going through a storm this morning. Father, they'll quit looking at the boat. They'll quit looking at the waves. And they'll start focusing on you. Father, that regardless of what's going on around you, you can give us peace in those storms. Father, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, and that storm of life may be death, spiritual death, Father, I pray that you bring them to spiritual life. Father, they come to know you as their Savior, as their Lord, the one who calms the storm, the stable ground that they've been looking for, that they've been searching for. Father, I thank you and I praise you that you love me enough that you sent Jesus to save me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can